uh, that we have encountered uh, uh, during my practice uh, in the liver unit in Riyadh. And hopefully this will uh, give you some illustration of the challenges that we have uh, inside ICU to assess the hemodynamic and how we can go about it. Uh, you can consider this lecture uh, or presentation as introduction to what we're going to have. I'm inshallah. going to Dr. Hawa, um, if you don't, Sorry. if you permit, um, I'm going to request all the participants to mute their um, computers or their cell phones. Please mute your device. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, I, I think it's clear now. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I was saying this uh, just to illustrate the challenges that we face inside ICU in uh, our daily assessment of hemodynamics and how we need to uh, deploy all what we have at our hands uh, to, to assess accurately the hemodynamics of the patient uh, because making the wrong decision will lead to harm uh, to the patient. So this is a, a case of 60-year-old uh, lady, a liver failure, uh, was waiting for a liver transplant. She was being treated for chest infection and uh, developed ATI and became hypotensive. So she was referred to the intensive care unit team. On examination, she looked jaundiced. She was obtunded by sponsor. Her respiratory rate was slightly elevated, 24, and her blood pressure was on the lower side, 100 millimetre over 45. Pulse pressure was 100 and uh, her temperature was normal at 37. Her oxygen saturation was 96% on nasal cannula of two liters of oxygen. Her chest examination was unremarkable, and her abdominal examination revealed distended uh, abdomen with ascites. So really the question, how would you assess her volume status to decide whether to get fluids or not? Uh, so these are the questions uh, will come to your mind. Uh, should we give fluids at all or we shouldn't? And why are you reluctant to give fluids? Why not give fluids to this patient and see what happens? What targets would you aim for uh, during uh, fluid resuscitation if you decided to give fluid resuscitation? And do you know when to stop giving fluids or to stop fluid resuscitation? Uh, I guess the most important principle in dealing with the hemodynamic patients that you need to make sure that there is adequate filling pressure in your patient before you jump into using uh, maybe other uh, circulation or hemodynamic manipulators. And one of the easy things to do always uh, is giving fluids back to the uh, equation of the map. And we say, uh, your patient, you have to think, do I have a problem with the stroke volume? And if you do, you have to think, am I dealing with a problem with the preload, the afterload, or the uh, contractility of the heart, or is the issue really in the system of vascular uh, resistance? Now, why do we worry about giving fluids? There is really mounting evidence now that giving too much fluids to our patients can lead to higher uh, mortality. And there's so many studies. I just caught you these two studies that illustrated that giving more fluids to your patients uh, would cause harm. Uh, in this uh, study of more than uh, of almost 1,200 patients, they found for each one liter increase in fluid balance, there is 10% increase in mortality within 72 hours. And this uh, obviously for septic shock uh, patients. So really what we are trying to achieve whenever we are uh, dealing with patients with compromised hemodynamics is we are trying to get them back to the optimum hydration uh, volume state because we know that overhydration uh, is detrimental and is associated with organ dysfunction, increased mortality. And on the other hand, uh, tissue uh, dehydration does cause tissue hypoperfusion. And really, it's, it's really a balance between the under resuscitation and hypoperfusion or the over resuscitation and causing the uh, organ uh, edema and uh, the consequent problems associated with it. And really, we are trying to achieve the optimum fluid balance uh, whenever we can. So uh, really, we try to tackle the issue of hemodynamic like a situation or we are putting together a jigsaw puzzle and 
in an attempt to reach to the optimum fluid status. And I think the easiest way or the uh, initial step should always be looking through the windows of perfusions. And what we mean by windows of uh, perfusions, it's simply assessing your patient's mental state, uh, check maybe capillary refill time, uh, or assess their urine uh, output. Uh, we know these uh, vital organs are very sensitive uh, to the hypoperfusion. So if your patient's mental state is affected, then uh, that usually indicates there is hypoperfusion. Uh, uh, if there is a prolonged capillary refill time, uh, then uh, this also would indicate uh, poor uh, tissue uh, perfusion. Or if there is urine output reduction, then probably the kidneys are not working as good as they should be. And we know that the kidneys are quite sensitive to any drop in the blood pressure, as we saw in the slide illustrating the relation between the mean arterial pressure and the uh, organ blood flow. Now, when you come to your patient, if the, your patient is away, then maybe the simplest way to assess their volume status is to ask them uh, about the thirst. This is a study uh, illustrated that uh, patients who are thirsty usually have reached the uh, uh, plasma osmolality of 285. And this is usually the earliest sign, if you like, of getting dehydrated. And uh, you can, from there, deduce that probably my patient is hypovolemic and probably I should push for volume. Unfortunately, in our patient, she was obtunded. Yes, she was responsive, uh, but the history might not be reliable from her. So really, we should utilize a different uh, way of assessing her volume status. One of the greatest, in my opinion, uh, ways of assessing a volume status is something called skin temperature gradient. Is simply by just assessing the difference in the skin temperature, starting from distally, and then you move proximally. And if you see there's change in the temperature uh, of your patient's skin uh, from cold to warm, then usually this indicates your patient is under resuscitated. And by giving them volume, usually they would respond nicely. I illustrate this uh, time and again to my trainees and patients and post of patients. They come out of or are usually hypovolemic or not or under resuscitated. And bus, just by holding the patient's hand, uh, you'll feel immediately they are cold at the periphery, but warm more centrally. And by giving them fluids, you see the warmth spreading uh, distally, uh, which is quite pleasing usually. This is uh, an interesting study was uh, done a long time ago uh, where they compared the findings of the uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressure compared to whether the patient has got cool or warm peripheries, and there was significant correlation between the results of skin temperature gradient and the findings of the Swangans or the PA catheter. And another way of assessing your patients uh, is really by looking at the mocking score, which also predicts uh, survival in septic shock. Um, unfortunately, we might usually see it clearly when it's advanced, and that means your patient uh, is quite in an advanced state, but it's worth, men, uh, worth keeping in mind and looking for it whenever you can, just by looking at the lower limb over the kneecap and see if, the, um, if there's mottling or whether the mottling is spreading uh, or not. Having said that, our patient is quite vasodilated, being a liver failure uh, patient, and she didn't have any evidence of mottling, or at least not yet anyway. Right. Now, um, does peripheral perfusion help? And we were talking about assessing the capillary refill time. Uh, this was uh, uh, explored in this Andromeda uh, study, and they compared the capillary uh, refill uh, time or peripheral perfusion group assessment to lactate uh, group assessment. And they, yes, they, it wasn't statistically significant as a, a result, but really it was, in my opinion, uh, very, very encouraging to see that the uh, skin temperature or tem uh, capillary refill time assessment did almost as good as following the patient's lactate clearance uh, during resuscitation. So I would say, yes, it's really important to use the, uh, the uh, capillary refill time to assess the volume status of your patient. 
Now, having said all of that, a lot of people cast doubt about the physician's ability to assist the, the human bank or the circulation. And again, this is an old study from the days of the pulmonary artery catheter, and they found that doctors were not as good uh, in predicting the, uh, circula- this, the volume status of their patient when it comes to, uh, to PA catheters. Uh, I don't know why the slide they didn't show up, but uh, it said the doctors, half of the doctors got it wrongly when they assessed the volume status of the patient before they uh, got the results of the PA catheter. Right. Uh, well, we will try to, to look through the windows of perfusion. That wasn't helpful. So we'll try to use non-invasive methods. So probably we can use something called vascular pedicle width. This is a, a study uh, we conducted in uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Riyadh, uh, with Dr. our colleague, Dr. Uh, Nawaz Salahuddin. And basically, you measure the uh, vascular pedicle width at the level of the carina. You draw a line from the right side of the heart to the origin of the uh, subclavians from the aortic knuckle or the junction between the subclavian, sorry, the, the junction between the clavicle and the aortic knuckle. And if that was uh, more than 64 uh, cent- uh, millimeter, then there's a good chance that your patient is adequately uh, hydrated. Uh, however, if they are less than that, then probably there's a good chance that your patient uh, is uh, going to be fluid responder. Uh, having said that, you cannot just do X-ray uh, after each fluid resuscitation to assess whether your patient achieved that vascular pedicle width of 64 millimeter or not. Then you probably can use the IVC uh, to assess the IVC variation uh, during uh, spontaneous breathing. Uh, we know it's not as reliable as using it during mechanical ventilation. However, it does give you an idea, bearing in mind uh, that for it to be significant, the variability uh, should be more than 50% compared to 15% only when you are assessing the mechanically ventilated patients who are breathing passively in the ventilator. But we need to keep in mind that there's, there's limitations to the IVC assessment and one of it, uh, uh, the effect of inter-abdominal uh, uh, pressure on the IVC or whether your patient has got pulmonary hypertension uh, or not, or whether the respiratory effort of your patient is with the normal or the patient is acidotic and having deep sighing air, uh, air breathe, and that will affect uh, the reliability of your uh, IBC assessment. You can use cardiac echo. It's another great tool, non-invasive uh, and quick, uh, and can give you um, the ejection fraction um, straight away, assess the pericardium, and it gives you multiple answers about the patient's hemodynamics. But really the question, how good are you with echo? We know echo is operator dependent. And if you're not that good, then are you going to call the echo tech to stay in ICU? And whenever you do fluid resuscitation, you will use the echo. Sometimes it might, might, might be that practical. I know more and more people are in ICUs uh, around the, the globe learning how to use uh, basic echo or focused echo in ICU, which I think uh, quite helpful, uh, but I'm not sure we are there yet. And then you have to ask yourself, is there a really good correlation between ejection fraction and the cardiac index? And this is, uh, if you like, a constant fight between the intensivist and the um, uh, cardiologist. The cardiologist will say, oh, this is not cardiogenic shock because the ejection fraction uh, is 50. However, we know from this uh, article that some patients do have um, uh, high ejection fraction, so ejection fraction above uh, 35 or even 40, but still their cardiac index is below three. So that means they have cardiogenic element uh, to their uh, shock state. So uh, we need to keep this in mind whenever we are using the echo uh, on the ICU. So to complete the JEXO, then probably we need more more information, and here we can use uh, perfusion indicators. One of the easy indicators that we can use is the uh, lactate, and we, we know that lactate is quite helpful uh, in assessing uh, tissue perfusions because it reflects the uh, oxygen uptake at the mitochondrial level, 
However, we know there's other possible causes or plenty of causes uh, of hyperlactatemia. And in our patients, if she is septic, that might be contributing to it, or her liver failure itself can cause hyperlactatemia. So just you need to keep that in mind when you are using these perfusion indicators. So the patient, back to our patient, she continued to drop her blood pressure, and now her blood pressure is 70 over 40, and she already received more than 30 ml per kg of intravenous fluids. So the question really comes, what you need to do next? Then probably, as you would expect, a CV, you see a central venous catheter was inserted, and this can be helpful because you can check the CVP. If the CVP is low, then almost certain you can say your patient is hypovolemic because there's not many causes of low CVP other than uh, wrong measurement. As I said, a lot of normal people live on the steep curve of the Frank Stalin curve. And if I measure uh, the CVP of you or myself, and uh, first thing in the morning before I drink or have my breakfast, then you'll find that your CVP may be two or three, or sometimes might be even in the minus. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to give uh, fluids to your patient. Having said that, in patients lying in ICU, hypotensive, low CVP, to me, this is an indication of, of, uh, of uh, fluid resuscitation. Uh, having the CVC might help you also check the central venous oxygen saturation. And also you can check even the waveform and from it deduce some information as we can uh, as we will discuss this later on, inshallah, uh, in this course. Uh, having said that, uh, from this uh, systematic review, we know that CV per, per se is not really good. It's not just like tossing a coin. And this is really a merely applicable when we are talking about CVP of six to eight. And you think, oh, is this a good CVP or not? Or if you see the CVP is 12 or 14, then you say, oh, this patient doesn't need fluids. Here, the CVP doesn't help. But as I said, the only, for myself, the only use of CVP is whenever it's low. When it is high, then I don't rely on it. The other use of CVP might be if you have at the same time cardiac output monitor, and we'll see this later on how it can help deciding uh, the fluid resuscitation of the patient. Right, so the jigsaw puzzle is uh, completing, but not yet clear. So we did the venous oxygen saturation or central venous oxygen saturation of this patient and came back at 72. What does it mean? Does it mean really that uh, we need to take any action? It doesn't help if it comes, had it come 60, then probably I would think then there's probably low cardiac output state and I need to apply uh, inotropes. Uh, but the fact it came back normal, then probably that doesn't give me much uh, room to, to benefit uh, from it. Uh, we can, the fact we have central line, we have arterial line, then probably we can do something called the uh, CO2 gap or the uh, arteriovenous or venous arterial uh, CO2 gap. And this would usually indicate low flow state. Uh, and when it, it's associated with low uh, CVO2, then probably your patient would benefit from inotropes. Again, we'll talk about this in more details uh, during the course of this uh, course in China. So this patient, unfortunately, now became unstable and ended up on the mechanical ventilator, and she's getting more hypotensive. And now the dilemma where we go with her hemodynamic manipulators. Does she need more fluids? Does she need pressors? Does she need inotropes? For sure, at this stage, probably she doesn't need fluid or fluid. Not yet anyway. Right. So how can we assist this? Then probably we can deploy some of the uh, heart-lung interaction uh, or tools that utilize the heart-lung interaction principles. And here we can use uh, non-invasive methods or minimally invasive, we should say, uh, pulse control analysis devices like the flow track or peak or rapid. And this will give, will give us continuous cardiac output measurement at the same time, give us stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation beat to beat. The problem with these devices are uncalibrated. And if your patient ended up on moderate to high doses of pressors, then the reliability of their 
uh, readings uh, can be affected. We know that these patients, for the results to be reliable, then they need to be passively breathing on the on the ventilator in sinus rhythm and at least receiving 8 ml per kg uh, time their volume. You can use a dynamic test, and here we can use the passive leg raise test, and this would be quite helpful, but remember for it to be valid, ideally your patient should be connected to a continuous uh, cardiac output monitoring device, and as you can see here, uh, you have to raise the patient's legs at the same time, putting the head down and see the change in the cardiac output. If there's change more than 10%, then there's good chance that your patient is fluid responder. And this, the reason this happens because the passive leg raise test would allow 200 to 300 ml of auto transfusion. You are allowing uh, some blood to go to the central circulation, augmenting the heart function, but without having to give external fluids uh, that might be detrimental to your patient if he wasn't a uh, fluid responder. But we need to keep in mind that there's some limitations for the uh, the passive leg raise test, namely that if you cause pain during this maneuver, then the endogenous uh, adrenergic uh, um, release will cause the blood pressure to go up rather than a true response to the uh, fluid, uh, to the autotransfusion. Okay. Now, the patient is evolving into ARDS and went into multi-organ failure state. And here now we need advanced and invasive hemodynamic monitoring device uh, to assess the patients uh, quite uh, accurately. And here we can use uh, either the transponder thermal dilution uh, device or we can use the esophageal uh, Doppler uh, monitor. Again, all these uh, devices, we'll talk about them, inshallah ta'ala, and the advanced uh, assessment of the uh, hemodynamics. Uh, the uh, invasive tools, as we said, either tools that utilizes the transpulmonary thermal dilution, uh, either the uh, volume review by Edwards or the PICO device uh, used to be produced by Pulsion. Uh, or you can use the PA catheter or the uh, Swan GANS, uh, our old friend that went out of fashion uh, for, the, for all the reasons, in my opinion. Right. So, with the invasive hemodynamics, what are the advantages? Really, you dissect the hemodynamics to its uh, basics, if you like, and with that, you can direct yourself what is the best next step for your patient. So, the preload uh, assessment uh, measures can be the stroke volume variation, the pulse pressure variation, the global endastolic uh, volume or index, all, I wouldn't worry about this, guys, if you are not understanding all of them, because, we, as I said, we will talk about these devices, inshallah ta'ala, in the uh, advanced assessment of hemodynamics uh, session. Uh, you can check the stroke volume, stroke volume index, uh, and also you can measure the CVP and the pulmonary artery uh, occlusion pressure. Uh, also, you will have reflectors or indicators of contractility, namely the cardiac output, cardiac index, or the global ejection fraction, in PICO, the cardiac performance index. And if you are using the PA catheter, then the left ventricular systolic work and the right ventricular systolic work. And then you will have reflectors of the afterload for both the right side uh, of the heart as well as the left side of the heart. And not only that, you'll know when to stop by using the uh, extra long water index uh, measurement or um, a cutoff uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Right, uh, any question uh, so far? Hello, Dr. Howard. Uh, I have a question, it's not related to that. My question is, yes. uh, is there any role of pulse oximeter in uh, determining shock? Right. So, uh, yeah, you are talking about plat platysmography variability index. Uh, unfortunately, this device is not reliable inside ICU. Might be reliable 
either on the floor, patients are off the are not on presses, or even in the uh, operating room. But to utilize them inside the ICU when the patient is on presses and the ultravascular tone, then probably they are not as reliable as they uh, they have been marketed to be. Okay, I don't know what happened here. Anyway, so uh, now the question is, can we use the dynamic parameters to uh, to assess the circulation? And, and the answer is, is really resounding yes uh, from this meta-analysis. Uh, so they found, they found using the uh, dynamic uh, um, methods to assess the hemodynamics uh, impacts on the IC length of stay. It impacts on the duration of mechanical ventilation and also the uh, uh, ICU mortality. So it seems there is room to to deploy these dynamic uh, monitors uh, to assess the volume status of your patients. And PA catheter is remains the if you like the gold standard. Uh, um, for assessing the hemodynamics, even though it has its own limitations. Uh, but all experts uh, currently uh, suggesting that we should use it whenever there is association uh, with ARDS and right ventricular failure or in complex cardiac cases, post-cardiac surgery, um, post-lung transplant uh, situations. Uh, otherwise, probably there is not much for the PA to be gained from the PA catheter compared to the transpulmonary thermal dilution devices. Now to answer the question, when to stop fluid resuscitation, then if you are using the extra, uh, the, the PICO or the uh, volume review transpulmonary thermal dilution devices, then you will get the excellent water index. And this, whenever you get to number 10, then probably you should uh, stop giving uh, your patients fluids. You might stretch the number a little bit to 12, if your patient showing evidence of response uh, as judged by improved perfusion uh, markers. However, once you exceeded 10, then probably your patient started to getting harm from fluids rather than uh, benefit. If you put your swangans on, then probably you shouldn't exceed pulmonary artery wedge pressure of 18, because above that, usually that indicates the, the lungs are getting wet and we know wet lungs are uh, poor lungs. Uh, the other situation where you would stop giving fluid resuscitation, and that I mentioned earlier, if you have a CVP monitor, at the same time you have a cardiac output monitor, and you give fluids, the CVP goes up whilst the cardiac output drops down, then probably that means uh, by giving fluids, you are compromising the uh, cardiac function of the patient, and you are now on the flat uh, or even the downward care part, portion of the bank is turning uh, care. Right. Finally, really, the message is, uh, if no evidence of microcirculatory compromise, i.e. the perfusion indicators are good, then ask yourself, do I really need to boost the microcirculation? I, if there's low blood pressure, however, the patient maintaining well, vital organs are working fine, normal lap day, then ask yourself really, do I really need to push this patient's circulation by giving more fluids? Uh, as we said earlier on, normal individuals live on the steep portion of the French silent care and they don't usually need a fluid resuscitation. In conclusion, no single test is good enough for assessing hemodynamic status of the patient, and that is why you must deploy all what you can to reach the best assessment of the hemodynamic state. We know overhydration is detrimental, just like the dehydration state, which leads to hyperperfusion and uh, organ uh, damage. With this, uh, I'll stop, uh, conclude the session for today, and I'll be happy to take any questions.